We are at Whiskey Pete's. It's a little after midnight and we were coming up on the end of my hours so we decided to get our 10 hours here before we can drive again. We're gonna go into the casino and look for the Bonnie and Clyde death car that I was telling you guys about. So here we are walking into the casino and I'll film more when we get inside there. <clears throat> Filming some more so you can see all the lights. I was wondering. The tram that goes across. Yeah. You. I was wondering how much Las Vegas, Nevada spends on their light bill every year or even every day. I think it's probably a lot because there's lots of lights in this place. And Blake has a cool story about Whiskey Pete. Tell it. It's true. So Whiskey Pete, the original guy, there was really a guy named Whiskey Pete. That guy up there. Well, I don't think that's him. But... Well, it looks like it. Look, there's a dude. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's him. Anyway, so he, well, that dude right there, he had a little gas station out here in the middle of nowhere, a long ways away from Las Vegas, like an right. hour, an hour away. And uh, he wasn't making very much money with the gas station, so he started bootlegging whiskey and running whiskey around and stuff. During the Prohibition? During Prohibition. And when it was illegal. Then he uh, built a casino and so on and so on. Right. And then um, he was kind of a, a weird old dude. He just, he wanted to be buried. He requested that he would be buried. Standing up. Standing up. And when they w did the addition back here on the parking. Over there. Garage over there. Supposedly the story is, is that they're were, they were underground. There's some caves around here. There's some caves. And, um, and they found the skeleton that had been propped up standing up. And it was and Whiskey it was Pete. Whiskey Pete had been buried in had a cave. Had been buried in a cave standing up. And I don't know why he was standing up, but... He wanted to be standing up. That's what he requested. Because he wanted to be a stand-up dude. Even after he died, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so here we go. Should we get some advice from Whiskey Pete? Yeah, let's get some advice from Whiskey yeah, Pete. Here he is. One dollar to get some advice from Whiskey Pete. Okay, Whiskey <clears throat> Thanks for stopping by and talking to Whiskey Pete. I got a lot of advice for you. Heed my words. Tis better to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than to flap those gums and remove all doubt. <laughs> I got plenty more pearls of wisdom for you. Just drop in another one of your sweaty gold or silver pieces. Either one's gonna make me smile. <laughs> Wow, that was, that was it, it for a dollar. <laughs> Thanks, Whiskey <laughs> Pete. Ooh, what do we got here? Is it your horoscope? Yeah. You gonna read it? Let's see, Aries. I'll, I'll read mine next. My flower is Sweet Pea. Sweet Pea? My first stone is Diamond. Nice. When's yours? June what? June 9th. What, what, what's your sign? I'm a Gemini. It's kind of hard to see when the phone's right in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> I can't film it. Gemini? Yeah. Uh, your flower is the rose. Okay. Your birthstone is a pearl. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Pete. Look at all the... Hey, you. I see you Look at all the there, quarters. Right? Throw some quarters at Whiskey Pete. Here's the thing. So does it tell the story? Whiskey Pete's. Whiskey Pete is a famous hotel casino, not exactly in Las Vegas, nearly 50 miles southwest of the Strip. <laughs> During the Great Depression. What? Making uh. whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Moonshiner's Corp is talking about it, I think, right here. Oh, does it? Is that what I read? Yeah, ever since. It's tough as shit. Yeah, I wouldn't mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> ever since the inadvertent ex exhumation of the Moonshiner's Corpse, spirit is said to haunt Whiskey Pete's Casino time and time again. Guests have reported the eerie sensation of being watched while gambling in the casino. As guests look around to see if anyone's watching, they find an aged man who looks like someone out of an old western film staring at them. They look away and look back or simply blink their eyes and the apparition vanishes. <laughs> there are also reports of the Bonnie and Clyde death car ex exhibit, exhibit being haunted by the not-so-departed soul Clyde Barrow. Clyde and his girlfriend Bonnie were gunned down in the car in Louisiana in 1934. The infamous bullet riddled death car, along with the shirt Clyde was wearing at the time, are currently exhibited at Whiskey Pete's. We could not dig up any reports of anyone actually seeing the ghost of Clyde Barrow, but some have said they feel an unnerving presence when looking up close at the shirt, especially, but also car. It's certainly not enough information to say the exhibit is haunted, noteworthy at best. Also rumors that notorious crime lord Al Capone's famous bulletproof car, also on display at Prim, is haunted, but these speculations warrant a lot of skepticism. This particular car was never involved in any real gunfights. When the owner of the hotel acquired the villainous wheels, he wanted it to look more like an authentic mobster car, so he had it delivered to the back of the hotel, shot it up himself with his own guns. Cool. So here we are at the casino. Oh, that's pretty cool. Here's the Bonnie and Clyde car. Those are the authentic bullet holes, huh? Mm-hmm. In the windows. Man. There's Clyde. There's Bonnie. Yes, this is the original authentic Bonnie and Clyde death car. Look at the plate. Here is that plate. 1931. V8. What kind of car is it? I don't know. It's the side they shot. Wow. Those were uh, bullets that went all the way through. Man. What, the cops shot him? <laughs> yep. What kind of car is it? Steve Baker. I don't know. Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm right there. Duo lamp. Hmm. It's a Ford? Yep. 1931 Ford? Yep. Is that Al Capone's car over here? Uh-huh. And they just shot that one up for fun? They just shot it to see if it was really bulletproof. And does it look bulletproof? <laughs> uh, I don't think they got very far. It's a pretty cool old car. Man, that's crazy. So there's the Bonnie and Clyde car. And this is Al Capone's car over here. Dutch Schultz. That is a cool looking car. It's in good shape other than the uh, bullet holes. Over here. Supposedly bulletproof, huh?
Yeah, those bullets went all the way through, didn't they? The doors are filled with lead, so I don't think so. Huh. They just pinged them. They didn't go all the way in. Wow. So it was a bulletproof car, huh? Yeah. Such a cool old car. Big old car. So here's the timeline. For Bonnie and Clyde. Twenty three and twenty five is when they got shot up. Him. sitting on the truck. A man in overalls, a little bitty fellow. Said he had the keenest black eyes he'd ever seen. Actually, me and Clark started the bear gang in prison. Frank was the third member of the Richard gang. Bonnie was the fourth, and there's several others waiting. Bonnie was small, thin, and uh, what I call a dishwater blonde. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, just not very blonde, but blonde. Last days of their life. All they were doing was buying time because they knew they were going to die together. So that car was shot up. Young people were shot up. You lost some blood in there, dude. I stood on the running board of the car and looked inside, face to face with Clyde Bell after he was killed. On May 23rd, 1934, the infamous pair of outlaws Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker drove down this road just outside Gibbs Land, Louisiana. They were but seconds away from a hail of bullets that would end their lives. But their legend lives on today in many ways brighter than when they were alive. The truth, told here for the first time by those who were there, is a story of love Sweet old Chevy. Violence. Yeah? Yep. Doing trucker stuff? Yep. Oh. covered both the body and the soul of the United States. In the grim years that followed, it reduced many of America's once solid citizens to desperate people willing to do anything they could to survive. Shanty towns, bread lines, and riding the rails were common sights. Banks closed in many towns and cities. Farmers were willing to go almost any place to improve their lives even a little bit. The Dust Bowl certainly added to their misery. Against this dark curtain, a different kind of hero captured the imagination of many Americans. Desperados such as John Dillinger and Babyface Nelson drove through the Midwest robbing banks and gas stations. They were involved in wild shootouts with the law, which captured newspaper headlines across the nation and a public following that rivaled movie stars and sports heroes. They became idols of sorts to the common man because they represented the law of survival. Leaving several dead men in their way, Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker had a career that lasted only a little more than two years. 
and yet history has judged them to be two of the most fascinating criminals of that era. Clyde Barrow was born to Henry and Cumi Barrow on March 24, 1909 at Ennis, Texas, 35 miles south of Dallas. Not much more than sharecroppers, even in prosperous times. The elder Barrows barely survived from cash crop to cash crop. They decided to move to Dallas in the early 20s to be with their older children who had already moved there. Opening the Barrow gas station on Eagle Ford Road was a much needed step up the financial ladder. But money problems, now intensified by the Great Depression, made just getting by difficult. It was while they lived here that Clyde and his big brother Marvin, better known as Buck, began running together. The money was tight and times were hard and they did have, you know, chip in the hip and all, the family. Well, I guess at an early age they wanted things that, you know, that they couldn't have and uh, so I guess that was the best way to get them. Just go out and take something or something or another. And then after that <laughs> Clyde got in trouble, well, it seemed like that every time that he that anything happened, they always tried to lay it off on Clyde. Yeah, and they questioned him and come out and, and you know, always thought it was Clyde or Buck that done something. I knew it wasn't right or nothing, but I love both my brothers. And I don't think they did a half the things that the newspaper said they did. Clyde was a, I think he was a tender-hearted boy. I loved him very much. He was very good to me. He bought me my first one. I don't know if he bought it or where he got it, but he brought me the first bicycle I ever had in my life. I kept that bicycle while I was grown. Bonnie Parker was born at Rowena, Texas on October 1st, 1910. But he got me my first mile bicycle. At age 16, he <coughs> was a small time thief named Roy Thornton. But the relationship was short lived. Roy was caught during a burglary attempt and sentenced to a long term in prison. Never bothering to divorce her husband, Bonnie, who lived close to the downtown area, worked at a variety of local cafes and became acquainted with several members of the Dallas Police Department, including Ted Hinton and Bob Alcorn. Both were later to play a major role in the last moments of her life. In early 1930, when Bonnie was 20, she went to a girlfriend's house and there met the man she would spend the rest of her life with. Bonnie and Clyde were, like I said, they were just kids and they're very much in love with each other and they would either reach over and smack each other on the cheek or something or another when they was out and, you know, always calling each other sweet names or something, but they, they were very much in love with each other. He loved her and she loved him. Most historians have never understood the reason behind the formation of the original Barrow Gang. Clyde, who had been sentenced to 14 years on two counts of car robbery and five counts of burglary, first met Ralph Fultz, already a hardened criminal by the age of 19, when they were both being transferred to the feared East End Prison, located just outside Huntsville, Texas. Fultz, who had previously escaped from East End, described conditions which were so bad that many prisoners would mutilate themselves in an effort to avoid work in the prison labor fields. Managed by a corrupt and brutal system, it was common practice to beat prisoners senseless with baseball bats, wow. run over them with horses, or just murder them. The old prison cemetery stands in silent testimony to those orders. Even though his prison duties kept him very busy, Clyde stayed in constant contact with his family through letters such as this, complaining about the conditions and by sending small gifts on special occasions. Clyde Bear was always real close to his family. He loved his mother and he loved all of us. We were all real close family. And when he was in prison, well, he made this little necklace for me and sent it to me when I was a girl. Of course, it's about right tore up now, but I've had it all these years. <laughs> While Clyde was in prison, Bonnie would visit him as often as possible. We kept up with Bonnie. She uh, come around the house, you know, to see Mama. And she stayed all night with us several times. And she'd write Clyde and tell him, your sister Marie's talking my ears off. <laughs> 
So I guess I should was a chatterbox or something. She'd write and tell him about it. Was? She'd stay <laughs> all night with us and visit with us quite a bit. I liked Bonnie. She was just, you know, she was a sweet little old girl. She was real tiny and little, wore three and a half shoe and was very tiny and just real sweet. And she was very much in love with Clyde and he was very much in love with her. In the early spring of 1931, Clyde, who up to that time had always been described as being quiet and sensitive, was separated from Fultz because prison officials began to suspect that they were planning an escape. They moved Clyde to another camp there at East End, where he met, among others, Henry Methley, who would later play an important role in the last moments of Clyde's life. And at about this time, an older prisoner named Ed Crowder trapped Clyde and sodomized him viciously. Yeah. Clyde retaliated shortly thereafter by killing Crowder in the dormitory behind the columns. He hit him on the head with a piece of pipe. And from that point on, Fultz observed that Clyde had changed from a schoolboy to a rattlesnake. Clyde and Fultz also decided that when they got out of prison, they would form a gang, return to Easton, raid it, and free as many prisoners as they could. Before the plan could be finalized, Fultz was paroled and the forced labor inflicted upon Clyde intensified because of his new attitude. Clyde was so upset that he cut off two of his own toes in an effort to get out of the work. And unfortunately, on February 2nd, 1932, he was also paroled, which made the mutilation unnecessary. And he returned home a bitter and angry young man. He just seemed like he just got meaner like or something other I don't know he just I don't know he just didn't care much anymore about anything. Clyde must have started the bear gang in prison. We recruited ex cons as the other members of the gang. Of course the original gang was Clyde and myself, Raymond Hampton who I got out of jail in McKinney, Texas, and Bonnie Parker got in by accident. Shortly thereafter Fultz and Hamilton were captured and sent to jail. Then, a new name was added to the Barrel Gang, William Deacon Jones, better known as W.D. I've known W.G. Jones ever since I was a little kid, because W.G. Jones and his family lived down on the campground, too. W.G. Jones was a handsome boy. All the girls thought he was good-looking. He had several good-looking brothers, too. He didn't recruit W.D. W.D. just wanted to go along with him, and he'd take him off with him one time, and then he brought him back, like I said, and said, well, you go home because you're not, you know, nobody knows who you are, and you have, you have just stay at home. But he didn't do it. He hung around up and down the road, that the Ford Road, looking for Clyde to come by where he could go on to him again. The killing of Fort Worth Deputy Malcolm Davis in West Dallas gave additional unneeded publicity to the Barrow Gang. I know that uh, that it was at Lily Hamilton's house when he uh, <coughs> stopped and went up to the door. Well, this Malcolm Davis threw a gun on him and says, you know, to stop, you know. And anyway, I think that Clyde shot, but his his pistol got, uh, jammed at the time, and uh, W.D. was shooting. And Bonnie made him quit shooting because she's afraid he would hit Clyde. But evidently Clyde pulled the bullet out with his fingers and evidently he did shoot the policeman. Now, our WD did one. I don't really know which one did. In late 1929, Buck Barrow, Clyde's older brother, was sentenced to four years in prison for burglary, but made a daring escape after serving less than a year. It was after the escape that he met Blanche Cadwell, and it was love at first sight. Even though he had been married twice before, theirs was a love story which matched in intensity that of Bonnie and Clyde's. Blanche was an attractive woman with a flair for theatrics. A serious camera buff, she was always either taking photographs or posing for them. She and Buck married after a short courtship. Later, as a result of constant urging by Blanche and his mother, Buck surrendered to the authorities and returned to prison in 1931. Governor Ferguson issued a parole for him on March 20, 1933, 
citing the convict's poor health and general good behavior. Buck then promised the Texas authorities that he would find Clyde and convince him to go straight. The following month, he and Blanche had a family reunion of sorts with Bonnie, Clyde, and their traveling companion, W.D. Jones in Joplin, Missouri. Life for Bonnie and Clyde was about to become very serious. The Highway Patrol hadn't got the information, first of all, that uh, this suspicious activity was going on here. They contacted the Joplin Police Department, and they, along with a Newton County constable, obtained a search warrant and then came to the apartment to serve that warrant. Uh, they were expecting only to search a residence uh, of a bootlegger or possibly burglars, but they were not expecting what they uh, actually found. Clyde Barrow and W.D. Jones had just come back from a scouting expedition. They had just parked their vehicle in the garage and Clyde was about to close the doors when he saw the officers coming up the street. The first officer out of the car was Newton County Constable Harriman. He jumped out of the passenger side of the front seat and ran around to the garage door that was open here and attempted to stop them, Clyde from closing the door. Of course, he had no idea who the man was or uh, what to expect, but uh, Clyde opened fire on him with the shotgun, caught him in the neck and the shoulder, and that was the first officer who went down. During the general firing, the officers noticed uh, from the upstairs windows a woman and young man firing at them. Uh, this was later found out to be Monty Parker and their friend W.D. Jones. Uh, this is interesting because it's the first time that they had positive proof that uh, Bonnie was actually involved in shooting herself and not just Clyde and W.D. Jones. At this point is when the second officer, Harry McGinnis, was shot over on the passenger side of the car. About that time, the door of the apartment swung open and a woman come running out, screaming hysterically. She had a small dog yapping at her heels, and they both went down the hill here towards Main Street. The officers weren't really expecting this. They didn't expect to have a woman involved with uh, bootleggers, so they wasn't sure if it was a girlfriend or a hostage or just what she was. That left one trooper over here at the other house uh, behind the corner. All the firepower was then directed towards him. He had one bullet left. He, he was stepping backwards and stumbled, and they figured that they had shot him. They moved the bodies out of the way, uh, dropped the brake on the uh, police car, pushed it out of the way, and then got in there, forward, and headed towards Main Street. When they got down to Main Street, they picked up Blanche, who was still screaming and running with her dog, and got her in the car, and then they went south down Missouri. 43 highway. In an overall sense, the importance of the Joplin shooting, I think, is the, of course, the death of the two officers. But of equal importance, I think, is the personal items that they left here in the hideout. Among those items were uh, rolls of unprocessed film. Once the film was processed, America, for the first time, was able to see what Bonnie Parker and Clyde Burrow looked like. Before that, they were just names in the newspaper. In that batch of photographs was the famous picture of Bonnie Parker uh, smoking a cigar. Uh, she told many family members, as well as those that she had kidnapped, or that the gang had kidnapped, that she did not, in fact, smoke cigars and that she wanted them to tell America that. She was embarrassed by it, but it was something that haunted her for the rest of her lives. In fact, if you look at the other photographs on those same rolls of film, uh, you'll see that Clyde has that cigar in his hand. On June 10th, 1933, just outside Wellington, Texas, Clyde's famous driving skill failed him. With Bonnie and W.D. as passengers, he lost control of the car, which skidded off the road, rolled down an embankment, and burst into flames. Before Bonnie could be pulled from the fire, her right leg was severely burned, 
from that day on, witnesses remembered Bonnie limping badly or being carried by Clyde. Now, on July 18, 1933, Bonnie, Clyde, Blanche, Buck, and Debbie D. all stopped at a small motor court just six miles south of Platte City, Missouri. Nearby was the Red Crown Tavern. The manager of the tavern and the local sheriff took a little bit of an interest in those young people who had rented the cabins. They watched, for instance, as W.D. teased Blanche about her weight when they were in there buying food for their friends. Their original opinion was that these were school kids on a summer lark because they were small and they were very young looking. The next day, Blanche went to Platte City to buy some additional medical supplies for Bonnie's burns. The local police there were convinced that these young people were in fact the barrel gun. Missouri Highway Patrol and the Kansas City Police Department were then called and a request was made that they come to the tavern and make sure that they were all very heavily armed. In fact, they even ordered an armored car. Around 11 o'clock on the evening of the 19th, the police began to move into place. Armored car was pulled up to block the garage and the local sheriff pounded on Blanche and Buck's door. Clyde immediately opened fire through that garage door, wounding one of the officers and disabling the armored car with a barrage of his steel jacketed bolts. At the same time, Buck and Debbie D also opened fire with clip after clip from their BARs. And strangely enough, the armored car was pulled back, leaving an escape route wide open. It was during this wild melee that Buck was struck in the forehead with a 45 caliber slug, and Blanche was hit in her left eye with shards of broken glass. During a momentary lull in that action, the Barrel Gang all piled into one car and made their getaway. Driving east at speeds exceeding 80 miles an hour, Clyde skidded into the Dexfield Amusement Park and Campsite, located just north of Dexter, Iowa. The park offered the privacy needed to tend to the wounds suffered by Buck and Blanche. However, the discarded bandages, which were soaked with blood in the bullet holes of the car, began to attract the attention of the local residents. Finally, Dexter's two police officers began to add things up and didn't like what they found. They then called the Des Moines, Iowa Police Department for some additional help. Thinking that the strangers were probably nothing more than bootleggers or possibly hobos, an estimated 50 young men and women from the Dexter area decided to follow the police and watch the fun. Kurt Pfeiffer, who was there that morning, remembers. There wasn't too much excitement around in 1933 in July. They went out, we went out, parked their cars back, half a mile back down the road. Everybody walked up with them. Where we knew the site was, actually we uh, 